I wish I was a cabin boy aboard a man of war. Sam's got a way aboard a man of war. Pretty work, brave boys. Pretty work, I say. Sam's got a way aboard a man of war. Hi, I'm Samuel Siegel, Executive Director of the Schooner Pursuit Historical Society, and welcome back to Privateer Timeline of the Revolutionary War part four. In this episode, we're going to deal specifically with July of 1779 through November of 1780. And let's get started. July 27th, 1779. Chestnut Neck, New Jersey returns to service as a privateer port. August 12, 1779, Captain Douglas was found guilty of illegal capture of two Spanish vessels. September 25, 1779, the British transport Triton was captured by two privateer ships, Mars and Comet. September 29, 1779, the prize ship Triton arrives in the port of Little Egg Harbor, New Jersey. October 9, 1779, the British transport Badger was captured by an unknown privateer vessel. October 10, 1779, the British frigate Solby recaptures the British transport Badger. April 18, 1780, Captain Mariner and nine men in whaleboats recapture the privateer vessel Black Snake in Sandy Hook, New Jersey. April 20th, 1780, the British brig Morning Star is captured by Captain Mariner. August 7th, 1780, three privateer vessels together capture the King's mail ship Mercury Packet. August 8, 1780, three privateers capture two Loyalist schooners, the Nancy and the Arbuthnot. For the duration of August 1780, those three ships, which were the Fair American, the Holker, and the Enterprise, later to be switched out with the General Green, go on a month-long joint cruise to capture no less than six additional vessels. August 31st, 1780. The three ships that had banded together to start hunting were stopped on their way to resupply in Philadelphia. The vessels that stopped them were the Continental Navy ships, the Trumbull and the Dean. This ended that pack hunting as both the Continental Naval ships had pressed all but a skeleton crew on each vessel. So they lost almost all of their sailors to the Continental Navy. September 2nd, 1780. 
owners of the Fair American and Holker petitioned Congress to get their sailors back. November 1780. The privateer vessel Revenge captures the British merchant sloop Susanna. As most of you know, I like to leave you with a little bit of a bonus. Today, we're going to take a look at one of my favorite small arms, the 1756 Sea Surface Pistol. But before we discuss this, we have to talk about the powder. So as you can see here, I have a few things. Um, Let's start with the powder. Black powder is a small, fine grain explosive compound. It burns, but unless it is compressed, it will not explode. And by compressed means in a confined area where once it catches fire, those gases have nowhere to go. Then it'll explode but black powder itself will will burn and will burn quickly and with great ferocity. So how do we get that to go in to this to use to shoot? We have to put them in something called a cartridge. Now here I have one displayed openly. You have the ball you have the powder, and then you have the cartridge. How you make the cartridge is from a form. Everybody has forms, and we cut them. We cut the paper out for what we're going to do. Then, whether it be parchment, um, Bible script, uh, newspaper, what have you, at the time, we would take that form, find a wooden dowel that was about the same size as a musket ball, place the musket ball on the top of, and then roll to get the shape of the cartridge. Now once that ball is in there, whether it be separate or together, um, you had the option then of twine around twisting and that would hold the ball in place as well as provide a patch for those that decided to go a little above and beyond they would actually attach the patch and sew it to fit around the ball and the patch would typically be lubricated with a bore butter or um a fat of some kind to help get it down the barrel when you take the rammer and put it in. You've got your powder, patch, and ball all in one here in the cartridge. That would be stored in a, in a cartridge box or a cartridge pouch that you would have on your person as you went into battle. How that was loaded at the time, you would take said cartridge, rip it off, have your weapon on half cock, pour a little bit in, close your frizzing, pour the rest of the powder down, and then you could shove what was left, either you discard it or this with the ball would be put in and then you pound it all the way down. Now, it looks easy because it's one, it's empty, and two, when we're doing reenactments, we only ever put powder in. Very rarely will we have a shoot that requires a live load. You can tell one will be loaded because the ramrod will stick out the end a little bit longer than you have. 
and then right down in here is where your powder would be here and then your ball you've heard the term running off half cock in half cock it won't go forward you can pull the trigger and it will not fire so if you you're running off half cocked and you fire you'll pull the trigger and nothing will happen because it's almost a built-in safety but it's not a safety um, it's just not completely cocked so in order for it to cock though you'd have to pull it all the way back in order for it to fire There are many different tools that they had um, to help aid with the, cl the cleaning um, or the field maintenance. One is called a sergeant's tool. It is a three-shape device in which you will see two screwdrivers and um, looks like a punch, but that's actually to help. There's some of, some of them have holes that you can may need help to take off in order to get to a flint. They had flints of various sizes depending on the weapon. Um, this one will take either a wide or a thin flint. It was hit or miss whether they went off. You had a 50-50 shot. If you've got a good flint and you've got enough carbon in your frizzin, it's going to go off unless it's wet. What makes this a very good weapon is you are getting two for the price of one, basically. You could pull the trigger, and if nothing went off, or if it had fired and missed your opponent, you can grab it and use it as a club. As you can see, there is a big, heavy brass fitting here, and it acts as a hammer or a club. So you would have that as a weapon of last resort if this end didn't work. Or if it did work and was ineffective. Can you imagine using these as ammunition? It's got a fairly decent weight to it. It's not going to come out of the barrel of this very quickly. Maybe 800 feet per second if you're lucky. It was not a pleasant experience to get hit with one of these. I will not go into detail on the damage that it causes, but it is quite significant. Unlike today, where we have the medical technology to remove it often you would have to rely on your ship's surgeon or somebody that had removed them that had the experience before and there was no anesthesia at that time so they would quite literally have you chomp down on a bit that's chomping at the bit while they dug around trying to get that and whatever clothing it happened to take with it on its way in. Not a pleasant experience. Join me next time when we discuss February of 1781 through July of 1782. Thank you for joining me. See you next time. I wish I was a cabin boy aboard a man of war. Sam's gone away aboard a man of war. Pretty work, brave boys. Pretty work, I say. Sam's gone away aboard a man of war. I wish I was a gunner aboard a man of war. 
Sam's got a way upon a man of war. Pretty work, brave boys. Pretty work, I say. Sam's got a way upon a man of war.